Hello, and welcome to this showcase session, which is designed to give an opportunity to our audience members to interact uh, with these experts in using nanopore technology for biosurveillance. Each one of our speakers is going to give a brief overview of their work before joining me in a general discussion where we'll also be um, inviting your questions and opinions. And since this is an on-site only discussion, uh, we'll only be taking questions from the floor, and we will not be using the event app. I'm now delighted to welcome our first guest, Alex Knubel. Alex received his bachelor's in molecular biology from Ohio Northern University. Uh, he went on to earn his PhD in molecular virology and microbiology at Baylor College of Medicine, studying comparative genomics of relapsing fever group Borrelia species. And Alex is now currently a postdoctoral fellow at Baylor College of Medicine's Department of Pediatrics in the Division of Tropical Medicine in the Vector Biology and Bacterial Pathogenesis and Translational Virology Laboratories using functional genomics to investigate research questions um, in vector host pathogen interactions and disease ecology. Is there anything you don't do? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I have a super eclectic uh, training background. Um, and so that's translated a lot into um, kind of getting into to nanopore um, and then kind of having, we were talking, um, you know, you're in a division or a department where you're the only person with bioinformatics expertise or any type of sequencing skills and then everything all of a sudden becomes, and I take this as something that's probably echoed by among a lot of people here, you become the expert for everyone and then everyone's projects now become your projects. Um, so kind of, I, I, I think the sequencing that we do fall, fall, kind of falls into three different groups. So we have plug and play, public health, um, disease ecology, and then basic science that kind of filters into both of those things. Um, so five projects that kind of come to mind for me is a lot of child amplicon sequencing for viruses. Um, so our group was uh, collaborated with the Ministry of Health of Belize on the early outset of SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic. And so we set up uh, in-country um, genomic surveillance and genomic epidemiology for SARS-CoV-2 using the Arctic pipeline and the, the nanopore technology. And so we kind of troubleshot some of that uh, in town in Houston, uh, where we're at, figured out kind of the, the nuts and bolts of that. We flew in uh, Ministry of Health uh, lab technicians, trained them, and then send them back with a mini and a, pretty much a gaming laptop. Um, and then 65% of the genomes that came out, uh, SARS-CoV-2 of, of the country, were Belizean scientists doing all the work in Belize, from sample collection to uh, GIS aid um, submission. So that was, that was really rewarding. Um, we're doing dengue sequencing in a similar uh, kind of uh, nature with El Salvador. Um, so that's kind of the plug and play uh, public health, uh, do a little bit of disease ecology with St. Louis encephalitis virus, which is a, another kind of tiled amplicon strategy, um, bridging uh, public health and um, uh, disease ecology. We have the Texas Tick Project, um, which is a citizen science project where people send us ticks. We do uh, full mitochondrial, mitochondrial genome sequencing to identify the tick, and then 16S along with targeted qPCR for pathogens. Um, and the basic science, I spent a lot of time on uh, tick-borne uh, relapsing fever and a lot of how that worked. We get a lot of samples from around the country and sequences. The, the Braille is pretty challenging. Then report those back. So Perfect. I do a lot. Thank you. Great summary. <laughs> um, and I'd now like to welcome our second guest for this session, uh, Camille Khanupov. Uh, Camille is an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston with a bachelor's in biology from the University of Houston and a PhD in computer science. Camille's laboratory specializes in developing methods and techniques for pathogen detection, microbiome characterization, and utilizing next-gen sequencing to improve health outcomes. Recently, he's focused on bioaerosol microbiomes and was appointed to a NATO science and technology research task group, so. Thank you. Um, I follow a very close path to Alex's, I guess. The fact that I started with just barely enough biology knowledge, but a lot of analytics knowledge to be able to take on various projects. And once you establish yourself a little bit, everyone just keeps coming back to you and back to you. Um, my, um, one of my main projects right now are the bioaerosols. Uh, we're planning to do biosurveillance in um, 
ma most major metropolitan areas in the U.S., uh, schools and hospitals, and we're planning to sequence about 2,000 samples on the Prometheon platform uh, and integrate real-world clinical data in order to improve public health outcomes and reduce disease risk transmission. Uh, we're also running a prospective clinical trial on burn patients in order to optimize pathways and time to treatment. Um, and another category is we support the NIH Centers for Research in Emerging Infectious Diseases in West Africa and South America, contributing to pathogen mo monitoring capacity building and outbreak readiness. Um, I'm excited to be here, uh, share in the wealth of all this information, and hopefully take some of the things that we discuss here back to our NATO Research Task Group meeting, which actually occurs next week. It's perfect timing. Fantastic. Now let's hear from our third scientist who also does it all. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our final panel member, Laura Kavanetsky. Uh, Laura is the research leader of the Pathogen Genomics and Bioinformatics Group at CONICET Argentina. During her postdoctoral career, she became a specialist in genomics and in collaboration with the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, uh, published the first tapeworm genome analysis. And now her group specializes in studying helminth parasites of significance in human and animal health, with both a medical and veterinary interest focused on the concept of One Health in biosurveillance and pathogen uh, IT. Thanks, Anna. I am the director of the genomic unit uh, of um, Argentina, from Argentina in Buenos Aires University, and is um, operating in the School of Science. And we receive uh, uh, several kinds of samples, water, uh, stool, <laughs> uh, tissues, and um, we perform long read sequencing with all of these samples. And thanks to Nanopore, uh, we could process all these samples very efficiently. And particularly, we are studying water contaminated with ni nitrates, and we are isolate bacterial which have um, nitrate coding genes, nitrate degrading coding genes, and perform biofilms to purify this groundwater. So we are very happy with the technology and the quick response it gives. Perfect. OK, so if there are any burning questions from the audience, I would invite you to raise your hand, and we can go around and pass the microphone to you. Um, Otherwise, I can get started with a quick question um, and just ask each of you why you chose Nanopore for your platform of choice for your applications. Yeah, so I guess I'll start. Um, for us, it was uh, accessibility. Um, so in a lot of the Central American countries and kind of low middle resource countries that we do our work in, because uh, I work in neglected tropical diseases, a lot of times country, other countries will come in and they'll give them MySeq or something like that. Um, and then they just leave. And there's no training, there's no service contracts, um, and then it's just really hard for them to kind of keep up with that. Uh, and then even infrastructure to support that is also a little challenging. So for us, it was very easy and straightforward uh, to train non-bioinformaticists and kind of non, you know, people geared up for genomics to basically give them what is essentially, you know, a USB drive uh, in a gaming laptop and then just show them, okay, this is how you pipette. Um, the next flow scripts uh, from the epi uh, epitome are, are really good for the, the Arctic workflow. Um, and so then it was, it was pretty much plug and play for, for that. So for us, it was accessibility and then also affordability. So Those are great factors. <laughs> um, all of our West African and South American centers got a gaming laptop and min-ions. Um, I think that's a pretty standard setup for most people doing biosurveillance these days. Uh, the other big factor is uh, the level of information that you get um, at about the same cost as doing high throughput sequencing. Uh, we specifically have been mostly on the Prometheon platform so that we can have very comparable um, data to high throughput sequencing from Illumina as far as cost per base, but get richer data and not have to you know, buy a half a million dollar instrument, figure out a way how to ship it somehow and support it. Yes, I agree with them. And also, uh, the P2 solo uh, devices is very useful for uh, developing countries, because mm -hmm. you could um, um, 
arrange the informatic device uh, separately, and we could have this long read sequencing platform in our region. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point in terms of accessibility, and you also bring up a good point in terms of capacity building. Um, do you think that, um, how, what is the best way for us to make use of this increased uh, resources and training that uh, happened as a result of the COVID uh, pandemic? And what can we do to build on that and to strengthen that and enable sequencing of other pathogens as well? Yeah, I guess I'll start off again. Mm. Um, I mean, we've all talked about this, actually, and it was really interesting. We all shared kind of similar uh, hurdles to, to overcome. And I think now that the capacity is there, and a lot of stuff that we do is plug and play for, choose what X, or XY virus or you know, bacteria, and the kind of process is the same. But it's getting the material, the flow cells, the, the NEB kits, to, to the, the place where the, the sequencing needs to happen. That's been the hardest and most challenging thing, um, is actually the logistics of, of moving material into country. For us, and this was kind of echoed too, um, it was easier to walk in these reagents than to actually have them ship from companies. Um, you know, just, it would be cheaper to go take a flight, you know, to, to Buenos Aires and just take <laughs> flow cells to you than it is for you to, to wait for, what you should say it was like a month or something like that to get, to, yeah, longer. <laughs> so that, that's been our biggest hurdle is, is kind of establishing a better, um, logistical infrastructure in these kind of developing areas? I'm a big believer in citizen scientists. Um, we've been playing with those types of projects for a very long time. And I think the, that's where we can play with the price point and the fact that most people who you know, can figure out how to use a pipette can figure out how to use a nanopore device. Um, and we want to say about five or six years ago, I was talking to someone who set up a company to monitor sludge water. Uh, he was running it purely out of his own garage. Uh, he was actually going around the medical center collecting expired supplies in order to basically decrease his cost per sample. And he turned it into a pretty nice company. Now they do monitoring across the board and sell all types of uh, microbes as probiotics. Uh, yeah. In Buenos Aires, after the pandemic, we organized a training course, hands-on, where mm -hmm. 70 stu stu students make their own libraries and run their own bacterial and metagenomics from water. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting uh, to apply nanopore to genomics training in South America. Yes. And capacity building is a big and important part of next-gen sequencing and enabling the sequencing of anything by anyone, anywhere. Um, so do we have any questions from... Ah, audience member question. Really great information so far. I guess the question is, from the biosurveillance and all the information you gather, what is the next step? Like, how do you use that information to make public health decisions or, or other decisions? Particularly, we select uh, bacteria that has, uh, have um, genes uh, codifying for the de desnitrification and then make biofilms to uh, purify the water in, in an ecological uh, way. I'll answer that with two thoughts. Um, one is not an existing project yet, but I hope it will become one. Um, we just sent it out and waiting for a response. Um, and there, we're using biosurveillance efforts in order to identify metagenomic features which are either beneficial or um, detrimental in the air to disease transmission. Um, and that was actually going to be used in school systems to adjust the HVAC systems and uh, reduce disease transmission among uh, school children. And the other half of that component is not just in schools, but in general across society. Um, the project that we had funded through NIH is to look at the real cost of uh, public events. Um, you know, what was the pathogenic load in the air? How many people got sick? Um, being a hospital, uh, we have access to wide amounts of uh, real world clinical data. And what I'm referring to in this context is for one of our systems, we integrate data from about 70 different hospital systems in the US, 250 million patients, and it gets updated every single day. 
And so if I do biosurveillance on day one, I can see what happened to the people in that city on day one, two, three, four. Um, from our perspective, uh, when you're working in different partner countries, it's kind of, you can give them the data and explain this is what's going on, but ultimately it's their ministry of health that really then takes that and, and, and informs their policy and what they do with that. You kind of, at that point, unfortunately, is like, okay, here you go. Um, a lot of it, you know, with, with SARS-CoV-2 was um, just kind of updating the public on what's going on. Um, it was important for a lot of the vaccine uptake, so they actually, within country, had pretty decent vaccine uptake early on um, because it was, they were constantly, you know, being informed of, of the situation. Um, Belize is actually a really small country. It's got a population that's slightly larger than Wyoming, if that tells you anything. Um, but it's the size of Rhode Island. So we actually, pretty much everyone that came in that was tested for SARS-CoV-2, if they were positive and met kind of certain criteria for sequencing, which is the majority of the samples, we sequenced them, that sample. Um, and so we actually ended up with quite a, quite a few uh, repre like a pretty nice representative data set um, that was, was constantly informing the, the public health infrastructure there. Um, and we were actually able to see some really cool introduction events that correlated with different um, different training activities for certain military organizations uh, where there's, you know, an isolate or, you know, a particular variant from one country ended up in Belize potentially after that. So, um, so there's some interesting, you know, kind of those things that, uh, and it's a touristy hotspot too, right? So that was also important to, to make sure that the, the government knew what was going on and what they needed to do, what they could do because tourist is so, tourism is so huge there, that was a huge business loss to them that, you know, could we open that up in a safe way? And those are kinds of the, you know, hurdles that you have to kind of overcome with that. Um, I think from a different perspective, what biosurveillance is really good for is setting uh, a baseline um, because we need to know what's there because if we're going to do any type of, if we, we need to know what's there to see what's going to be new or if we're going to do some type of um, treatment or some type of preventative, uh, we need to know if it's going to be successful. So that was one of the reasons for doing the dengue surveillance is, okay, we need to know what's going on in country. I mean, obviously right now there's an epidemic going on, so we kind of need to know what's going on there. But um, El Salvador is potentially one of the places for the Wolbachia releases, Wolbachia infected mosquito releases. And so they need to have that baseline to know, okay, well, what has that, what's the influence of, of the treatment that we're using? Um, and so you kind of need that baseline, otherwise you're going in blind and you really don't know if you were successful. Thank you, all great points. And so we're coming towards the end of our session, so I'll ask in just a few short words, um, what keeps you up at night? Um, what do you think, in other words, are the most pressing issues in infectious disease biosurveillance? Um, I think the, the, oh, yeah. That's okay. We'll if you wanted a break from no, time. No, 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 no. No, no, you, you. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I think a big part about this is QC. Uh, I think quality control is a big issue across a lot of the data that we generate and a lot of the data that we make our analysis and decisions based on. Uh, there are no uh, specific metrics. Uh, it's kind of the Wild West as far as who does what, how are organisms called, and why do we decide to make these decisions. I can use database A, Alex can use database C, and Laura can use <laughs> database D, and we're going to get very different results with absolutely zero correlation. You know, in theory, we can get different results, especially some of the databases contain misinformation. <laughs> yeah, pretty great. <laughs> okay. I think for me, it's funding, right? Um, we can build capacity, um, but it needs to be sustained. Yep. Uh, and Surveillance doesn't pay off until it pays off, right? So we, can't, we have to be vigilant in how we're looking at, uh, you know, these infectious microorganisms. Um, because, you know, if, if we're not constantly sampling and screening, sampling and screening, well, you're going to have things like SARS-CoV-2 pop up, and then it's all around you before you know it, right? Um, and I think the great thing about SARS-CoV-2 is that genome was made, you know, readily available fairly quickly. Um, and now with mRNA technology where it is, you know, you can respond to that pretty quick. Um, there's no guarantee we can do that in the future. We kind of knew with SARS-CoV-2 what the, the vaccine antigen was, but, you know, those are things that we need to be aware of. That you need to, to kind of fund the surveillance and, and sustain capacity in these other countries to, to really keep up with it. Yeah, yeah. I agree. <laughs> yeah. And so for you, what would you say is the most important issue in your work in Argentina? 
in, in Argentina, the, the, the important issue is that we could um, take all the samples with high quality and perform the sequencing necessary. Mm -hmm. And um, we have to, to train in a lot of people in bioinformatics and in genomics in all the country that is very huge. So education so and it training. Is a, this is our aim to not only in Buenos Aires, uh, but in all the yep. states that are very far away from each other. So this is our main objective. <laughs> Thank you. Those are all excellent points. And you've given us a lot to think about. Um, but unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, so thank you all for your participation, and thank you again, especially to our panel members, Alex, Camille, and Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Um.